Atlanta, where we're expecting the former president to take the stage in just a few moments. We have gotten confirmation now that he is inside the building there in Johnstown, Pennsylvania. Again, we are just waiting for him to take to the stage. As we know that this rally in Pennsylvania is important, the state of Pennsylvania is obviously important as well because it is one of those battleground states that the Republicans and both Democrats are vying for this election cycle. Live look, you can see that people are anxiously awaiting, having their signs ready, phones up, phones out, waiting for the former president to take the stage. It does look like we have a little bit of action there on the screen now. They've just zoomed in on that curtain. There he is. He has just stepped out there in Johnstown, Pennsylvania. Former President Donald Trump officially there to take the stage. We do know that Trump is expected to address a full range of topics there as he's in Johnstown with a particular focus there on energy. And if you've been listening in to our coverage here on Live Now, a few of those other speakers that took the stage earlier today also addressed energy and the plan that the Republicans want to have here in 2024 and 2025 moving forward for energy in several of these states. Of course, this is another time where you're gonna see the former president there interacting with the crowd as he often does. He'll often even turn around and take questions as well from supporters who are standing there to see him. Getting ready to walk up those stairs now. We can hear that music slowly underneath him as he takes the stage, looking around, making sure he's getting a good look at all the people there who showed up for him in Johnstown. Now this is in Cambria County at the War Memorial Arena there as well. Something again, this is Pennsylvania has been an important state for Donald Trump. Also where that assassination attempt happened back on July 13th. This isn't his first time back there in the state either. He's been back several times since that assassination attempt, continuing again his presidential run as he's trying to win the seat there in November. Again, him and Vance have done several rallies within Pennsylvania and other battleground states over the past few days and months leading up to the big election in November. Let's listen in just a little bit here to hear how things are sounding, but of course we're waiting to hear him officially speak. Playing that iconic song as well as he's getting ready. He's likely to let that full song play out which is getting to the tail end there. But you can see several people showing up, a lot in construction hats as well as he's getting ready to address energy and a lot of things that have to do with the economy as well in this much awaited, awaited speech. Let's go ahead and listen in here to Donald Trump. Well, thank you very much, everybody. I love this place. I love it. We've had great luck here. So just to everybody, hello, Pennsylvania. How are we doing, Pennsylvania? And I'm thrilled to be back in this beautiful commonwealth with thousands of proud, hardworking American patriots. That's what you are. It's coming. It's coming. Listen to this. 67 days. Wow. 67 days from now, we're going to win Pennsylvania. We're going to defeat Comrade Kamala Harris. Did you see her? Did you see her last night? Did you see her last night? I don't know. You think she's going to be able to handle President Xi? I don't know. I don't think so. China, North Korea, Russia, I don't know. But we're going to win back the White House. We're going to make this country greater than it's ever been. And everyone here today is part of the greatest political movement in the history of our country. You know that. Make America Great Again, MAGA. And whoa, look at all of the fake news. They got a, they got a lot of fake news back there. That's a lot of fake news, David. That's a lot of people. Some I like about 7% and some I don't like. 
No, that's a lot. But, uh, you know, when I say the greatest political movement in the history of our country, if I say something even slightly wrong, they give me 12 Pinocchios, right? 12 Pinocchios. <laughs> no, we can't say anything even a little bit wrong. I can't even joke. When I used to show Biden couldn't find the stairs off the stairway, they'd say, Trump couldn't find They'd say, they took it. And they would say, I couldn't. When uh, different things, the worst thing you can do with them is sarcasm, because it doesn't work with the fake news. <laughs> so we won't have any fun, but we will have fun. We're going to have a lot of fun. And I recognize you. How are you? And I recognize you. But no, it's amazing what, uh, what we built all together and started eight years ago, maybe a little before that, who knows? Probably started 40 years ago in our soul, but it started eight years ago and nobody would have thought anything like this could have happened. And it represents a tremendous piece of the Republican Party. And more importantly, it represents a tremendous piece of this country, tremendous piece, a lot more than 50%. Therefore, we have to get out and vote. This past week, I was honored to receive two endorsements of former Democrats for President Tulsi Gabbard and Robert F. Kennedy, Jr. And they're both great people. They were Democrats, as you probably know, and they uh, felt very strongly about the endorsement, and I feel very happy to get it. Every day, we are welcoming more Republicans, independents, traditional Democrats, and old-fashioned liberals, you know? They don't use that term anymore. They use progressive. We don't use that term. We like liberal better. Progressive sounds so good. It sounds progressive. They're not progressive. They're the opposite. Together, we're fighting to secure our borders, end the endless foreign wars, and defend the working people of America. And coming in, I heard some of the most beautiful speeches. I heard just beautiful, beautiful speeches. I want to thank all of the speakers that preceded me. Beautiful speeches. We're joining forces to defeat government corruption, restore free speech, and make America healthy again. We're going to make America healthy again, you know? We're a nation that is not doing well in a lot of ways, and we're not doing so well with health, but we're going to solve a lot of those problems, I think, over the next short period of time. A lot of it's common. A lot of that's common sense, too. It's all common sense when you get right down to it. But we're going to get toxic chemicals out of our environment, and we're going to get them out of our food supply. We're going to get them out of our bodies. We'll get them out of our body, right? Right? With victory this fall, we will enact this pro-family agenda, and we will bring back the American dream, bigger, better, and stronger than ever before. They never talk about the American dream. They never mention it. They don't talk about the American flag. By the way, the American flag, we got some of the greatest congressmen warriors here that you have anywhere. And congressmen, go to Congress soon, like immediately, but soon. We should give a one-year sentence in jail to anybody that burns the American flag. You should do that. Mike, do it, Mike. Right? Do it. That looks so bad at the Democrat National. I always call it Democrat. You know, they want it to be called Democratic. I said, then change your name. They don't change their name. <laughs> Sounds worse, so I use it. But at the Democrat National Convention, I watch those American flags burning all over the place. I think it's a disgrace. And they said it's unconstitutional to stop it. Like hell it is, OK? Like hell it is. It's not unconstitutional. It's like when I stopped the riots in uh, Washington. They were going, they were taking down statues. They were having a lot of fun. They didn't know what they were doing, having a lot of fun. And I pulled out an old law from 1907, because we don't pass laws like that, that are tough. And it said, if you touch a monument, if you touch it, even touch it against the will of authority, if you take it down, but if you even touch it, you go to jail for 10 years. And there's no nine years and five months, it's 10 years. 
And so I signed it. I took it out. It was dusty. It was old and dusty. Hadn't been used in 78 years, I think they said. And I signed it. I announced it. And I watched about 10,000 asses I could watch from the back as they left town. They were all gone. I, I knew there was a problem when they started ripping down a statue of Abraham Lincoln. I said, they're going to take down the statue of Lincoln? I don't think so. I, we're not going to let that happen. And we've got to be tough, because if you see what's happening in Aurora, Colorado today, did you see that? Where Ven Venezuelan gang members have taken over parts of the city. They've taken over apartment houses, because these Stupid people that we have leading our country are allowing these people, these criminals, to come and to come into our country, and we're going to get them the hell out of here. And this is just the beginning. Wait till you see what happens. Wait till you see what they're doing. Unbelievable. No, it's all. These congressmen, they're looking, they're just shaking their head. They can't believe it. They can't believe two things, actually. The size of these crowds, you know, you could fill this place up three times. Why didn't you get a larger arena? Huh? Somebody said, as we're riding by, oh, it's too bad the arena hasn't started filling up. I said, no, you don't understand. It's totally full. But the line goes back for miles. It's already full. But we got to do that, fellas, you know? We got to do it. Because I've been saying for a long time, I said, these people are coming in from prisons and jails. Nobody listened to me. They're murderers. They're drug dealers. If you take a look at Venezuela as an example, their crime is down 72%. Because they've taken their criminals from Caracas They've taken their drug dealers. They're emptying their prisons into our country. Their crime is down all over the world. Crime is down. In the Congo, in Africa, 22 people deposited into our country. Where do you come from, the Congo? We're in the Congo jail. What did you do? We will not say that. You can imagine. Listen, they come from Africa. They come from the Middle East, countries that are not friends of ours. And they're coming by the millions, by the millions. And these fools, Kamala, who's a Marxist, these fools are letting them come into our country, destroy our country. And I said, you know, did you ever see the hat? I don't want to brag, but they do have a big selling hat. You know what it says? Trump was right about everything, right? Front row Joe's. Front row Joe's. Right? No, but it's... Hey, look, if I ran one of those countries, I would be doing better than them at getting the people out. You run a country, the country's inundated with really tough people that are criminals. I want to get them the hell out. If I was the head of a country, the president of a country, if I was in charge of anything having to do with the country, I would have moved them out even faster than they're doing. They are moving people into our country at numbers that nobody's ever seen. And those countries are becoming safe countries. And wait till you see what's going to happen. You know, they're just getting acclimated. You know what that means, acclimated. They're getting used to a society that really goes too far. In the only thing they go after is guys like Trump because he protests an election. That's the only thing they're good at going after. They don't go after criminals. They don't go after people that kill people. They don't go after drug dealers that kill, on average, 500 people during their lifetime. So a drug dealer kills 500 people. And the only thing they would understand would be the death penalty. If you had the death penalty for drug dealers, you wouldn't have any more drugs. You wouldn't have any more drugs. Instead, we formed blue ribbon committees made up of our great first lady and lots of people like Steve Whitcuff, great developer in New York. But they don't do this for a living. The only thing they understand, I went to China, I saw President Xi, had a good relationship until COVID came in, then I broke it off. It was, that was too much. <laughs> but I said to him, and I had a great relationship with him, and I will again, probably. 
But I said, do you have a drug problem? 1.4 billion people. No, 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 we have no drug problem. Why don't you have a drug problem? Because we have the death penalty, he said, for drug dealers. If they sell drugs, they die, he said. So those people that sold drugs, they said, you know, let's go to another country. This is a little bit tough. But they do in many other countries. In countries where you have that, you don't have a drug problem. And we are becoming a drug-infested nation, whether you like it or not. We're becoming a drug-infested nation. So we better get our act together. You know, years ago, centuries ago, China was taken over numerous times by smaller nations, much smaller nations, because they were all drugged out from the opium fields and all of that. And then one of their very powerful leaders said no more, and they ended it. And we're going to have to end it, too, because we're really a country that is a, we're a failing nation in a lot of ways. What they've done to our country is incredible. What is Kamala, who's a total lightweight. Did you see her on television last night? This is going to be the president. This is going to be the president of our country? I don't think so. Sitting propped up on a desk with this guy, this, this uh, tampon Tim, tampon. <laughs> and it's the first interview she's done, and like, nobody's ever seen anything like it. And if you're too weak to do a one-on-one -on -one interview with a person that was so soft, you know, I know Dana, she's always, you know, always nasty. She was so nice to the Democrats. It's much easier to be a Democrat, but we don't agree in their policies because their policies will destroy our nation. So we can't do that. We can't do that. But it was a very weak interview from the standpoint of CNN. I think CNN should be ashamed of themselves. If that were me, aren't they? Sir, I heard you want the death penalty for drug dealers. Why? Well, you know, I'd like to end the drug epidemic, if that's okay. Remember this, and I said it. Every drug dealer, on average, kills 500 people. That's not mentioning all of the families that are destroyed forever. They're destroyed forever. And we have to do something about it, because we are becoming, and we are, a drug-infested nation. We have to do something. And if you did that meaningfully, you will, in one week, stop the drug problem. Nobody's going to be selling drugs. Nobody. I don't know if the country's ready for it, but they should. You know, we lost. They give you fake numbers, the real numbers. We lost uh, probably 350,000 people last year to drugs, to fentanyl and other drugs. I had a deal with President Xi, who was going to put that on, the, on their ultimate crime list. That's where they give the death penalty. If they make it in China, they sell it here. He was going to give the death penalty. When we had a rigged election, what happened is, when I left, they never picked it up. Biden never picked it up, so they never did it. But they were going to give the death penalty, which is their ultimate, ultimate uh, punishment. You can't get too much more ultimate than that. They were going to give the death penalty to the fentanyl makers in China if they make it and sell it in here. And they were going to do it because, you know, otherwise we weren't going to do trade. Little things like, we won't trade with you anymore. We won't pay you billions of dollars anymore. So easy. So easy. But people like Kamala, she let San Francisco die. She destroyed probably the greatest city, maybe one of the greatest cities, but could be. A friend of mine, Bob Tish, used to say years ago, he said San Francisco is the greatest city in America. That was probably 16, so he passed away. Great guy, he passed away. But he used to talk about San Francisco all the time. Today, you can't walk into San Francisco. She destroyed it. She destroyed it. She's the one that started it, too. She was the district attorney. Then she destroyed California, along with Gavin Newscomb. You know that? <laughs> One of the truly bad governors. But the fake news is doing everything possible, everything they can to help Kamala Harris. Do you ever notice nobody knows what her last name is? I go, okay, I'm going to give you the first name. Tell me the last name. I say, Kamala. Uh, they have no idea who the hell she is. 
But as they find out, you notice our poll numbers are starting to skyrocket. When they find out that she's a Marxist, when they find out her father, you know, is a Marxist professor, you know that. When they find out that she was the one that destroyed California and San Francisco a long time ago, uh, you can't have this. Look, we have to put our country back into shape. Somebody said, women don't like Donald Trump. I said, I think that's wrong. I think they love me. I love them. I love them. Speaking of them, North Carolina, these women, this is number 227 rally. And they've been to some other than rallies. 220. They're wealthy as hell. Look at them. They've got nothing but cash. Their husbands are great. But they allow them to go all over the country. They follow me all over the country. We have front row Joes over here. We got the women from North Carolina. Look at them. And no, but they're great patriots. They're great patriots. And, you know, I spoke to the husbands one time. I say, how do you put up with this? Your husbands, your wives are traveling all over the place. Do you mind? We trust our wives, sir. We trust them implicitly. I said, well, you have great wives, let me tell you. But they've traveled, I think it's like 228, something like that. But it is beautiful to have you here. We love to have you here. Always perfectly quaffed. They're always perfectly quaffed, right? They're beautiful. They're great women, great women. And we appreciate their being here. We appreciate you guys being here. You were here in Butler. They were there in Butler. I remember they were standing there in the front. Front row Joes, you know what? They get here like three days early. They wait around for three days, four days. They probably got to know some of my guys by now. I would think they don't have to be quite so uh, anxious. They're going to be, uh, but they've done a great job. And then we have Mr. Wall. Irving Wall, would you please stand up, Irving Wall. He is a great guy, and he was there for Butler, too, wasn't he? He was there, I saw him there, but he's been to many shows. How many shows have you been to? He's lost track, I agree. I agree, but I appreciate it. We appreciate it. The whole place appreciates it. They're ultimately there. They're patriots. It's not about me. These are incredible patriots. These ladies are incredible patriots. So I just want to thank you. Incredible. But to show you how bad the fake news is, some of the Gold Star families, you probably read this over the last couple of days, and you know, a lot of people say, sir, don't hit down. Don't hit down on them, the fake news. Don't hit down, sir. Don't even mention it. I said, should I mention it? Don't hit down. Well, but it became sort of a story. So I always like to mention it. Because if you don't mention it, our supporters don't really know what to believe, and they sort of believe this stuff. So the Gold Star families and uh, incredible people, and I got to know them because uh, the 13 families who were, as you know, lost a loved one in Afghanistan so needlessly because we have incompetent, we have an incompetent president and vice president, grossly incompetent, and we had Millie and these incompetent generals that should have been fired immediately. Not one person was fired over Afghanistan. And by the way, Russia saw that, they went into Ukraine. Because they said, I had no idea that the United States was so stupid. So, and you know, when I was running that, I spoke to the leader of the Taliban. He run, they run the whole deal. And I said, Abdul, don't even think. Don't do it, Abdul, don't do it. Because they were shooting, they were killing our people. And they were really killing them previous to me and Obama. They were killing them in the Obama administration and with Biden. Biden. But uh, how did he do in the debate? A friend of mine said, sir, what did you do? You I said, how good was I tonight? Sir, you probably got him thrown out. Now you're going to have to run against somebody new. I said, I don't care. I have to do what I have to do. We have to do what we have to do. Yeah? And I look forward to the debate with her. But what happened, so, with Afghanistan, you know, I do the weave. You know what the weave is? I'll talk about, like, nine different things, and they all come back brilliantly together. And it's like, and friends of mine that are, like, English professors, they say, it's the most brilliant thing I've ever seen. And, but the fake news, you know what they say? He rambled. That's not rambling. 
when you have, what you do is you get off a subject to mention another little tidbit, then you get back onto the subject, and you go through this, and you do it for two hours, and you don't even mispronounce one word. And they say he had 100,000 people. You know, in New Jersey, we had 107,000 people. They never would like to report it, so I say it. But in Wildwood, New Jersey, they announced 107,000 people. And then they say, well, look at this. I mean, if you gave me a big arena, I would have, we would have said 45,000 people or something. But it is rather brilliant. But they say, yes, he rambled. But in Afghanistan, so what happens is you take the wonderful families and they come in, and we're in Washington. They said, would it be possible, sir, would it be at all possible for you to come because we're celebrating our child's life? The child was buried because of Joe Biden and Comrade Harris. Would it be at all possible, sir, for you to be there? And I said, it's going to be real tough. I was really, like, far away. And sometimes it's tough. But I said, you know what? We have to do it. And I got my team, and I said, let's go. We're going to Arlington Cemetery. Okay. I said, we're going to Arlington. Because again, I got to know these people. Because honestly, they would send me death certificates of their child. They said, sir, would you sign it? Please sign it. We refuse to accept his name on this death certificate. They said he killed our child, and honestly, the incompetence killed their, their children. The incompetence gross. And by the way, they lost almost 500 people that day, including the other side. They left Americans behind. They're still there. Nobody knows even what happened to them. Think of this. They left $85 billion worth of brand new military equipment that I bought because I rebuilt the entire military. $85 billion worth of equipment behind. They left everything, and they moved the military first. Instead of last, you say, you stupid people, you take the military out last. For 18 months, and a lot of you know this, for 18 months, not one American, after I spoke to Abdul, the leader of the Taliban, not one person was shot. We didn't lose one person for 18 months. In fact, Joe Biden got up on television one day, and he said, for 18 months, not one person was shot during the Trump administration. Then the people started screaming at him, you stupid, don't say that. You know, you are so stupid, they tell him. But I appreciate it that he said that. But it's true. For 18 months, nobody was lost, and nobody would have been lost, and we would have and we were getting out. I had it down to 5,000 people. But we were going to keep Bagram, which is the big air base, one of the biggest in the world, had the biggest runways, most powerful runways, eight foot deep. You could land anything on those runways. Not because of Afghanistan. We we're keeping Bagram for a different reason. One hour away from where China makes its nuclear weapons, right? So I got a call from the people. Sir, we're going to be going to Arlington to honor our children who were killed, and they are devastated, the people. I had them over at uh, Bedminster, and they didn't think I'd see them. And they said, do you think we'll see him? And they said, well, we don't know. He'll try and make it. I ended up spending four hours late at night listening to music with all of the relatives of the people that were killed, so needlessly killed. And I got to know them. I got to know them, and we were looking at the sky, beautiful place, so we're looking at the sky, and we're listening to Elvis, and we're listening to Elton John, we're listening to everybody, and I said, look, your son is looking down at you, and it was, the whole thing was beautiful, and you get to know them. I spent, they, they didn't think I'd see them, but at most, I would spend 15 minutes, and I ended up spending many hours, so I got to know them, so they called up, and they said, do you think you could be there, sir. I said, I'll try if I can. And we really had to turn things around. Anyway, I got there. And we had a ceremony. We had the changing of the guard. No, we had a beautiful ceremony. And then they said, sir, could you come to the graves? Could you come to the graves? After the ceremony, they said, could you come to the graves? Would that be possible? I said, I will. But 
I got like this big stadium, something was waiting. I said, but I'm going to because those people are the love of our lives. They are the love of our lives, right? And in all fairness, I can say there's the, the mother's father, sisters, the brother, but the various people that we're talking about, depending on who it is, but the various people, uh, they say it to me, I'll say it to you. I, mean, I, I don't think they can ever be the same. I said, is it better now? Because it's three years. Is it better? No, it's not better. You know, they have an expression, time heals all wounds. But I said, is that expression true? No, sir. It's, maybe it's worse now, sir. It's, it's devastating. These people are just so devastated. So anyway, we're there, and they said a prayer, different graves, one here, one there. And they said to me, I mean, I'm not surprised. I never even thought about it. Sir, would it be possible for you to have a picture with us on the, by the tombstone of my son? You know, the beautiful white tombstones, marble, beautiful, beautiful things, and carved, engraved with the names on them. I said, absolutely. I wasn't doing it for, I don't need publicity. I get a lot of publicity. I, get, I would like to get a lot less publicity. I would pay to get. I'm the only guy who would hire a public relations agent to get less publicity. <laughs> Most hired to get publicity. So I was taking pictures at the grave, one with the sister, and then the mother, and then the father come in, and then another group at a different grave. And, and it was so beautiful. And we left, and everything was nice. And then later on that day, I heard that we were using the graves of those soldiers for public relations purposes, you know? And that was all put out by the White House. Joe Biden killed those young people because he was incompetent. And then they tell me that I used their graves for public relations services, and I didn't. And I'll tell you what, it was a disgrace. And she was involved. Remember, she said she was the last person in the room, right, when they made the decision. And uh, pulling out was okay, but not pulling out like a bunch of incompetent fools. And that's what they did. We had them in such a great position. But when I took those pictures, it was so beautiful. They were crying. Everybody was crying. They were talking about three years ago, because of a grossly incompetent group of generals, and we have great generals. Don't forget, we defeated ISIS entirely with great generals, real generals, not these television morons that you see all the time. But when I saw that, I said, I think I have to talk about it. Now, my people said, don't do it, sir. Don't do it. But if I don't tell you the story, you're going to read. It was front page of the Washington Post, which has lost approximately 57% of their readers over the last three years. It was a story in the New York Times, which is losing reader after reader. I'm happy about that. I have to be happy because they truly are the enemy of the people. They are the enemy of the people. They tell false stories about me. That's all they do is they write false stories. They're incapable. I could do the greatest thing. I got to tell you, I ran for office. And they were covering it viciously. But it was front page every day, every day. And then I won. I beat everybody. And I had a story on page 17. <laughs> so I won, David. And my story was on page 17. But I was always on page one when I made a little speech or something. It's, uh, that's why they call it the fake news media. It's desperately trying to hide Kamala's failures and extremism from the public. They don't want the people to know how unfit she is to serve. She's unfit to serve. She, everything she touches, she ruins. Uh, just to finish this, I love those people. I'm so happy they took pictures of me and them and the tombstone and their lovely son or daughter. There was a daughter, too and an incredible daughter, frankly. I've almost gotten to know them, even though I never met them, but I know everything about them. The mother would walk up and say, Sir, may I tell you about my boy? You know, he was a football player, and he could throw the ball so far. He played quarterback, sir. And one day, and I realized that she's telling me a story and crying about her son, who's now in a grave because of 
Biden and Kamala. And I listened to that whole story, how the ball was caught, how the ball was thrown, how the team did, the season the team had, and I let her talk. And then these people accuse me of doing this for public relations reasons. And, and the fact that we even, the fact that we even got there, the fact that we even got there, so I just want to, and they were so good, they said, how dare they do that? We asked them, they did ask me. And you know, they actually came to my defense, it's nice, because sometimes that doesn't happen too. But they really did, they said, uh, we asked him to be here, and we want him to be there always, and I just think that's great, and we love you all, thank you. But I, I wrote for this particular group, you know, because this is, you know, she's anti-fracking, she's anti-everything, this Pennsylvania. And I said, uh, do me a favor, make a little uh, reel of uh, Kamala, Kamala Harris has no right being here. She got no votes, she ran, she was one of 22 people that ran, she was the first one to quit. She never made it to Iowa in the primaries, the first state. She was nasty to Biden. She called him a racist and everything else. You know, she probably called me a racist on in a week from now, week and a half. I look forward to that debate very much. <laughs> but she called him a racist. Remember the school bus? All she can do, she can memorize a little bit, not a lot, but she memorized a little story about a girl taking a bus. And she used it on Biden. And so when Biden picked her, I was shocked because nobody treated him so badly as her. But let's take a look at uh, the real Kamala Harris. Yeah, I am radical. We need to get radical about what we are doing and right. take it seriously. As President of the United States, I am prepared to get rid of the filibuster to pass a Green New Deal. There's no question I'm in favor of banning frack. We have to have a buyback program, and I support a mandatory buyback program. I believe it will totally eliminate private insurance. Let's eliminate all of that. But would you support changing the dietary guidelines? The, the, yes. The, you know, the food pyramid. Yes. Are the, yes. To reduce red meat specifically. Yes, I would. Raise your hand if, gover if your government plan would provide coverage for undocumented immigrants. Where do you stand on defund the police? This whole movement is about rightly saying we need to take a look at these Harris asserted that ICE is perceived as the modern-day Ku Klux Klan. Are you aware that there's a perception? I see no. Are you aware that there's a that perception? That puts ICE in the same category as the KKK. Is that what you're asking me? I see no parallel. I'm not finished. I see none. And yeah, I am radical. We need to get radical about what we are doing. But that's her, and now she's changed everything. In fact, I think she is going to soon apply for, give me an application for joining MAGA. She's going <laughs> to be wearing a MAGA cap. Now, that's her, and she can't do anything about it because that's where she is. Or with a politician, when they come out with something, that's where they end up, and she will destroy the great Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. Just remember that. And we should win a blowout. We should blow them out. You know, we win the state, we win the whole thing. And we won it in 2016, and we did much better in 2020, you know that, much better, with the whole election. Actually, with, in 2016, we did great, but 2020, we did much better, generally. Since Kamala and the media don't want to talk about her radical record, we will. Beautiful. That's beautiful. That's all right. That's okay. No, he's on our side. <laughs> we get a little uh, itchy, David, don't we? Our, no, no, he's on our side. You know what he's showing? At Butler, an amazing thing happened. You had two American flags, very far apart, held up, I think, by different cranes. They were very big flags, beautiful flags, and they were waving. 
And as that horrible event was taking place, the wind blew the flags together and they formed a perfect angel. I don't know if we have it, but it was a perfect angel was formed. I'll tell you, a lot of, a lot of things happened. If we have it, put it up. If we don't have it, that's all right. That's it. That's it. That's it. He had the angel. He held up the angel, and our people went after him. Oh, no, he's on our side. He's on our side. Thank you very much. It's very nice. I've never seen banners so beautiful, right? No, he's on our side. I mean, the problem is if he was on our side, you know, we can have 35, 40,000 people trying to get in. And if one person stands up and says, I don't like you, Trump, it becomes a headline. Major problems, right? No, but he is on our side. Thank you very much. That's nice. For nearly four years, comrade Kamala Harris has overseen a nation-wrecking border division, flooding our communities with 20 or 21 million, and it could be much more than that. And don't listen to 15 and 16. You're way gone. Those days are gone. 20 million illegal aliens from 158 different countries as of now. It's more fun to be than a Trump rally. Right? There's nowhere. There's nowhere. It's nice Friday. You know what? And we have plenty of time. Friday afternoon. Steve is here. David's here. All my friends are here. We have the best son in the world here. But all my friends are here, and uh, let's just take our time and have a good time, right? Or should I hurry it up? Should we give you the short version or the longer version? <laughs> Harris lost. Listen to these numbers, though. Seriously, let's just, if this were a Republican, they'd be stringing them up. Now, listen to this number, because you have to understand what it means. 325,000 children have been lost. They've been allowed to be trafficked all across our borders. She flew in illegal aliens by the hundreds of thousands, and many of these were young children. But we have no idea where three, think of the number, 325,000 children are missing. Many are dead. Many are involved in sex operations. Many are working as slaves in different parts of probably this country and probably many others. But she was the border czar. Now she says, I wasn't the border czar. But she was. It was headlines, border czar, border czar. But now she doesn't want that term. But what she, whether she was a border czar or not, she was in charge of the border. 325,000 children are missing. She created a fast pass entry program to speed the admission of illegals into all of our ports of entry. And remember when they said, no, no, we're, you know, we're gonna, oh, now they have a new line. We created a strong border. No, no, they keep saying it over and over. The worst border in history, but they think if they keep saying it over and over, you know, most people aren't like us. They're not that, you know, they drive a cab. They're carpenters, they're electricians, they're accountants, they're lawyers. They're, they're not, like, into it other than they like Trump. They like, meaning they like our policies, because it's not about me. This is not about me. I had a nice life. You can ask my friend. I had the greatest life. I could go to the most beautiful places, look at the most beautiful oceans in the world. Instead, here we are, and I'm happy as hell to be with you, because I like it much better. I like this much better. I like it much better. You know why? Because we're doing something. We're saving our country. 
I wouldn't do it just because I like it. We're saving our country. Our country needs saving. We're a failing nation, in case you have any question. We're a sadly failing nation, and we're going to make America great again. It's very simple. So we're a failing nation. We're going to make America great again. And I think we have a chance to make America greater than ever before. And remember this, if we don't do it this time, you're never going to have another crack at it. November 5th is the single most important day in the history of our country. I believe that with all my heart, because our country's going bad. And Kamala vowed to grant, remember, mass amnesty and citizenship to all of the millions of illegals that she let in, which will obliterate Medicare and obliterate your Social Security for seniors. You will not have any Social Security, and you're not going to have Medicare. The whole country is going bad. And no country, no matter who it was, no matter which country it was, no country could withstand this onslaught. No country could withstand this. And a lot of these people, remember, these are rough people. The only thing good about it is they make our gangs and they make our bad ones look like nice people by comparison. We have bad ones, too. But compared to the people that are coming into our country, our criminals are very, very nice. These are really tough ones. They come from prisons. Remember that. Many of them come from prisons, and they let them out of the prisons. Why should they keep them when the stupid United States will take care of their situation? Remember that. And this is what you're voting on. On, By the way, at the end of September, by, much before November 5th, I always use the term November 5th, but I'm talking about because today we vote two months early. We vote after early. Nobody knows what the hell we're doing. The elections are so screwed up. We have to get back in, and we have to change it all. We want to go to paper ballots. We want to go to same-day voting. We want to go to citizenship papers. And we want to go to voter ID. It's very simple. We want to get rid of mail-in voting. Mail-in voting. Jimmy Carter headed up a commission. By the way, the happiest man in the United States today is Jimmy Carter, President Jimmy Carter. Uh, my wife went to the funeral of Rosalind, beautiful funeral, like eight months ago. And I looked at Jimmy. Jimmy's old, but he's happy. You know why? Because his administration is considered brilliant compared to this administration. Brilliant. He's a happy man. But Kamala called for the abolishing of ICE. Great patriots, tough as hell. Some of my friends are sitting right here. They're some of the toughest human beings I've ever met. They're not tough enough to be in ICE. They won't do it. These guys, they see a pack of MS-13 thugs that love knives. They love cutting people up better than guns because it's more painful. They killed two young girls in Long Island not so long ago. 16 years old, they were walking to school. They, cussed, they cut them up into pieces. They cut them up into pieces. They will go into a pack of MS-13 killers, our ice guys. And for two minutes, you see nothing but fists and legs and fighting. A lot of the people like these young ladies from North Carolina, they're not into that. I don't know. I think they, they don't want to hear about that. They don't like to hear about people being cut up. They don't like to hear about MS-13. Have you ever seen MS-13? Typically, when you have tic-tac-toe boards on your forehead, it's not a good thing, right? <laughs> they would go into these places, and they would start fighting. And at the end of two, three minutes, it's over. And they would stand up, and they'd take these thugs into paddy wagons, and they'd bring them the hell out of our country, and they'd get them out. <laughs> and the problem we had, as you probably heard, was that the countries wouldn't take them back. Honduras. Uh, all of these, El Salvador, Guatemala, Mexico. But they wouldn't take them back. They wouldn't take them back at all. And when I came into office, I said, we're going to get these MS-13 killers. And we had thousands of them in our country. They were set out by the countries where they came from, mostly those countries I just named. And a general told me, sir, we can't do that. They won't take them back. I said, why? Because Obama tried very hard to take them back. 
Barack Hussein Obama. Has anybody ever heard of Barack Hussein Obama? Remember Rush Limbaugh? Barack Hussein Obama. Rush, the great Rush Limbaugh, right? We miss Rush. We miss, we miss him. But they wouldn't take him back, and the general said, sir, they won't take him back. They put planes on the runway when we're about to fly in. They'll take their commercial jets, put them on the runway so he couldn't land. They'd stop up all the buses, so they'd bring them there, and they'd have to turn around, couldn't get them in. This is for years. I said, General, how much money do we pay them in aid every year? Sir, I'll find out. So he comes in to find So we give them $750 million a year. By the way, sounds like a lot. That's peanuts compared to what we give them, but it's still a lot of money. Sir, we give them $750 million. Okay, you let them know that effective immediately, they're no longer getting any foreign aid. They're no longer getting any help. No more help. So the time went by, and I came into the office the following morning, nice and early, which I do. And what happened was very amazing. All three countries, these three countries, called me the heads of the countries. Sir, there seems to be a problem. What? Is there anything I can help you with? I heard you're very disturbed about us. Yeah, you're sending over in the caravans your thugs, your killers, and your MS-13 gang members, and you're not letting them come back into your country, and we're bringing them back. If we have to do, I don't give a crap what we have to do. We're bringing them back. Sure, please, sir. We would be delighted to take MS-13 back. They're wonderful individuals. I said, does that mean you're taking it back? Well, sir, I understand you're no longer making payment to us. I said, that's right, and you'll never see that money again. You better open up. <laughs> sir, we would be delighted to take them back. All you had to do is ask. <laughs> Ten minutes later, I get a call from another, the exact same conversation. Could have put it on tape, it would have been identical. Sir, is there a problem? Yeah, you're not taking your criminals back that you sent into our country. We would be delighted to do so. And we took out MS-13 by the thousands and thousands and thousands. And now they're probably all coming back through this weak and pathetic administration that we have. Kamala has provided deportation immunity to the vast majority of criminal aliens. Immunity meaning you can't get them out. Living inside the United States, she's importing MS-13 gang members back into our country. Nothing's going to happen good with MS-13 gang members. And they're going into our high schools, and they're going to class in the high schools, and they're accosting our kids. They're rough kids. These are rough ones. We are being conquered in a certain way from within. If you think about it, like in Colorado today, Aurora, they're, they're taking over the city. They're taking over. They're going in with these massive guns, AK-47s and others, AR-15s, if you ever heard of that one. But they're going in, and they're taking over our cities. You watch what's going to happen. We have hundreds of thousands of these people in certain of our cities. And if you think they're going to behave, they're not going to behave. These are rough people. These people came from rough places. And they're just sort of getting acclimated now, right? They're getting acclimated. And now they're finding out, gee, we're not allowed to, you know, the police aren't allowed to talk rough to you or the police gets arrested. I mean, if the police, does, if the police people do their job, they end up losing their pension. They end up losing their families. They end up losing their house, their car. And they're learning this, these guys. And wait till you see what's going to happen. But it's already been happening. They've killed many, many people in our country. I was at the border last week, and I was with the parents and other family members of some of the young kids that got killed, viciously, violently killed by illegal immigrants coming into our country. We can't have this. It's just our country. It's not sustainable. Our country's going to fail. These people are stupid people that are running our country. They don't have any common sense. They believe in an ideology. And if you look at Kamala and you look at what she's done to every
Every place she's touched, you know, I, you might have heard this, Franklin Graham is wonderful. And he wrote me a letter and he said, sir, I love your stories and I love listening to your rallies, but could you please don't use foul language? Your speeches would be even better if you didn't use foul language. But there's an example. It's not really that bad a word, but how can you top that word for what I'm talking about, right? What word? <laughs> Every place she touches wouldn't be nice. People would, that would be a thud. It would land with a thud. No. And Franklin's probably right. I, I'm not sure I agree with him, but, but he's a great guy, actually. But he, he did say that to me. He said, please don't. And so I try and avoid it. My wife also, she says, please don't use foul language. But it's hard. You know, there's some words that, that can't be duplicated. <laughs> they can't. I try, but I, it can't be duplicated. Comrade Kamala launched a radical left war on Pennsylvania energy that will destroy the economy of your state. On Kamala's first day in office, she shut down the Keystone Pipeline, which I approved. She shut down drilling on all federal land. She re-entered the disastrous Paris Climate Accord. Do you know what that was? That was the worst deal, other than it sounds so nice, the Paris Climate. It basically said that this country is screwed. It said this country is going to pay billions and billions of dollars. Other countries are going to pay nothing. China, as an example, pays nothing because they consider it a developing nation. We're not. We better start developing fast or we're not going to have a country left. So I terminated it. I terminated it. We pay billions of dollars. Russia pays nothing. China pays nothing. India pays nothing. And they won't pay for years, but we pay because we're a bunch of suckers. And I terminated it. And one of the early things that Harris did, because she's the one that pushed it, is they renewed it for even more money than they were paying before. It's the craziest thing I've ever seen. You'd, you'd, almost, you'd almost think they hate our country. Kamala Harris surrendered our energy independence, spent hundreds of billions of dollars on the Green News scam. She's trying to take away gas stoves and heaters. She's vowed repeatedly that we will ban fracking. We will always ban fracking. She just said it today. I saw it. They have a clip from like two years ago. She said, no, no, I'm in favor of fracking, like last week. Oh, no, no, I'm afraid. Then they start playing clips. We will always ban fracking. There will never be fracking. The people of Pennsylvania are smart. They're not going to fall for it. She will destroy. If you don't have fracking, you don't have a, you don't have a commonwealth. She also imposed a crippling natural gas export ban on Pennsylvania oil and gas, another catastrophe for your state. And this is all stuff that she's done. And I want to call up, I, I'm flying in with some friends on a very nice plane. It has a very nice television. And I'm watching RSBN, and I'm watching Fox, and I'm watching a lot of them. RSBN, by the way, how good is RSBN? Oh, they do a good job. So beautiful. It's like it's the Super Bowl every time we do a rally, right? They do a great job. Thank you, RSBN. Where are you back there, RSBN? Thank you. Wow, what a job. What a job you do. But we were watching, actually, RSBN. And there was a man there named Mark Kasky, the founder of Steel Nation. And he made the greatest speech. And it didn't, wasn't necessarily a win. Churchill type speech because Winston didn't wear a pith helmet and Winston's hair wasn't quite as long as Mark's hair and Winston was brought up in the Oxford tradition but it was actually just as good he actually gave me ideas I thought I was the one that was exposing how bad it's going to be in Pennsylvania and our country if we stop doing the fossil fuel thing because you know, in Germany, they stopped. 
in the country was ready to go down the tubes. Now they're building a coal plant a week. A coal plant a week. And Angela is no longer with us. She's no longer with us. But where is Mark Kasky? Is he still around? Oh, look at him right here. Oh, he's probably shocked. I don't know who the hell he is, but you gave the greatest speech. Would you come up? Can I shake your hand? Man, you are something, Mark. Winston Churchill, I'm not. I was born and raised in Carolina and in Pittsburgh as an adult, and I've been a yinzer for a long time, President. <laughs> you know, the war, the war on energy and, and, and by, the, by the left, it is, and it's not just here, it's, it's worldwide. What's happening in Europe right now is a shame. To, to, to even think about EVs here in America when the technology's not there. We would have to cover two-thirds of America with solar panels to, create, to power this great country of ours. We have the Marcellus Shale right below our feet in West Virginia, Ohio, Pennsylvania, and New York, but New York's not bright enough to take advantage of it. Those Qu that Cuomo family kind of shut that down a while ago, President. We, have a, we were on stage with President Trump in 2019 in the, at the convention center in Pittsburgh. We're going to have better results this year, but the, the people behind me, let's stick together all the oil and gas and, and coal workers, nuclear workers, power plant workers. Let's put Mr. Trump, President Trump, over the line. I'm watching Mark, and, you know, he's uh, talking about all the things that happened when they, they shut down everything. They then closed up Keystone XL. People forget. I had it approved. I approved it. It wasn't going to happen. Billions of dollars had been spent. I approved it. They came in. They shut it down. The only one they didn't shut down was the uh, Russian pipeline going through Europe, right? Nord Stream 2. Nobody ever heard of Nord Stream 2, Mark, until I came along, right? Russia was building the biggest pipeline in the world, going to Germany and various other countries in Europe. Countries that we defend against Russia. Think of this. So we defend them against Russia with NATO. We pay billions and billions, and far more than we're supposed to be paying, because they had a lot of people that were delinquent. But after I got finished, they all, they paid, you know? They all paid. They said, would you defend us if we don't pay? I said, no. They all paid. Took about... Obama used to come in, make a speech, and leave. Bush came in, made a speech, and leave. And you know, remember this. Under Bush, Putin took a lot of land. Under Obama, Putin took a lot of land. Under Biden, he's trying to take all of the land. All of the land. Under Trump, he took nothing, nothing, nothing. Right, Mark? He took nothing. But Mark said, and I said, write this down. Mark, do you have a copy of that speech, please? It's much easier. Just give me a copy. But no, he named like six things that happened immediately. But one of them was so big because the Keystone XL pipeline was a big deal. And that was like, going to bring a lot of a lot of oil in, and it was going to go in. You know, this pipeline's underground. It's safer than trucks, I guess, right? And uh, a lot more efficient. It was a big deal, and I approved it. And this guy came in, and he immediately dropped it. But you know what? He did approve Nord Stream. Now, I shut down Nord Stream. Russia was upset with me. Putin said, you know, if you're supposed to be my friend that hate like hell to see as my enemy, I closed the biggest deal they've ever done. It was shut. And then this guy came in who's got a low IQ, very, very low. Now he's got maybe no IQ. You have to check it out. <laughs> and he immediately, the first thing he did was approve the Nord Stream pipeline. And then they'd say, Mr. Congress, oh, look who we have. 
Byron said that, please. Superstar of the future. He's already a superstar, but he's a superstar of the future. Byron Donalds, Florida. Wow, that's nice to have you here. That's good. He's great. And he's great. He knows exactly what I'm talking about. That one is smart. You have smart ones, and you have some that aren't quite so good. But we have a group of people that are really great. But so I stopped Nord Stream 2, stopped it cold. Was it going to happen? This guy comes in, he approves it. Then they say, oh, Trump was nice to Russia. I wasn't nice to Russia. But you know what? Getting along with Russia is a good thing, not a bad thing. Remember that. Getting along with these people is a good thing, not a bad thing. It's a smart thing to do. I got along with Kim Jong-un of North Korea. Remember, I walked over the first person to ever walk over from this country, and I we also looked at his nuclear capability. It's very substantial. You know, getting along is a good thing. It's not a bad thing. The fake news would say, he likes Putin or Putin likes him. Let me tell you. They said, President Xi likes Trump. That's a good thing, not a bad thing. But we were tough with China, too. We took in hundreds of billions of dollars worth of taxes and tariffs. No other president took in 10 cents. When we win on day one, I will tell Pennsylvania to Drill, baby, drill. We're going to drill, baby, drill. And you know, a man named Mark Levin. Does anybody know Mark Levin? He's great. But he said something to me. He said, you know, he loves this country so much. His show is fantastic. And I do an interview with him this weekend, so I hope you're going to watch. But he's very smart, very tough. But he really loves the country, and he hates what he sees happening. But he sent me something. He said, if you'd like, you can read this at your rally today. And if you like it, you can use it anytime you want. And I think I'm going to do it because it's not very long, and we have plenty of time. And it's only about 100 degrees in here. It's actually not that bad. But Mark is a great man, and he's a great patriot. And he writes, here's what we know about comrade Kamala Harris. She just doesn't care about the American people, especially hardworking, middle-class Americans. She just doesn't give a damn about you. She does not care about the deaths, sex slavery, drugs, criminals coming across our border. She has been vice president for nearly four years, and she did nothing to stop it. All she does is complain. She says it's not her job, but it is her job. She does not care about the middle class struggling over inflation, the cost of gasoline, electricity, or the cost of food. She does not care if you lose your job or cannot find a job. She does not care if you have to run up your credit card. She does not care if your family are struggling and she did absolutely nothing to fix it. She's the vice president, but she just does not care. She does not care about women's rights because she supported destroying women's sports and athletic scholarships. She wants men to play in women's sports. She does not care about protecting little children from sex change operations because she chose Tampon Tim as a running mate who believes the state, not mothers and fathers, should have the final say on sex change operations for their children. Can you believe it? Can you believe it? Can you believe that? Kamala Harris wants to outlaw your car and truck and force you to buy electric vehicles, whether you like them or not, whether you can afford it or not, and they don't go far. She does not care how it impacts you or your family. Kamala Harris does not care about senior citizens because she believes illegal aliens should receive Social Security and Medicare, which she knows will bankrupt those insurance programs, making it impossible for you to receive your pension and health care, which you paid for for your entire working life. That's true. She wants to destroy your private health care, even if you like it even if your employer contributes to it. And she wants Washington, D.C. to make your medical decisions. She wants Washington to decide what procedures and medicines and care you should receive. 
Whether or not you like it is not important. Kamala Harris had nearly four years to show us who she is. She is an uncaring politician with a radical ideology. She is a Marxist. Despite her campaign of lies and flip-flops, we know who Kamala Harris is. We know by her actions and we know by her inaction. We know she does not care about working people, about the middle class, about any of our great American citizens. She does not respect you. Ask the families of the 13 service member heroes who died during the surrender of Afghanistan if Kamala Harris cares about our young people. Just ask them that question. Does she care about our military? The answer is no. Ask the cops in the street trying to protect you from murderers, rapists, and thugs if Kamala Harris cares about law-abiding citizens. Ask the families of women raped and murdered by illegal aliens and the teenagers cut to shreds by gangs from El Salvador and Venezuela if Kamala Harris cares about you. Harris has opposed school choice for poor inner-city kids. She's opposed police in schools to protect your children. And she's defended stocking school library shelves with filthy graphic books. She refused to prosecute pedophiles who molested your children. When she was DA and AG in California, two places she absolutely destroyed. Does this sound like someone who cares about children? <laughs> Kamala Harris has failed you. She has failed as vice president. She has broken trust with you. She has done nothing for the middle class working families. She's done nothing even for hardworking people. Your eyes don't lie. You see it. We all see it. She's sitting as the Vice President of the United States, and yet nobody knows who the hell she is. She does not give a damn about you. This is the real Kamala Harris, and now she wants a promotion. Well, I'm here to give her a demotion, not a promotion. She can hide and she can lie all the way through and with her surrogates and the corrupt media. But the truth is coming out. Right now, it's already coming out much faster than I thought. The American people are smart. They will not be manipulated by Hollywood, the fake news media, and all of the advertising. And you deserve a president who respects you, talks to you, who levels with you and who always has your best interests at heart. This November, we are going to tell Harris that we've had enough, that we can't take it anymore. You've done a terrible job. Kamala, you're fired. Get out. Get out. Thank you very much. We're pleased to be joined today by some warriors. We want warriors. That's what we need. And they're friends of mine, and they fought by my side, and we've done so many things. Right to try. We all know what right to try is. You're terminally ill, and you weren't able to get our space age great uh, medicines, cures. And we got the right to get it done. They tried for 50 years to try and get it done. They never got it done. We got it done. We got it done with the help of these people. And so many other things that we did. Rebuilding our military, building the wall. We built hundreds of miles of wall. These people are great people, and some of the best of them are representing the great Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. Representatives Dan Muser. Dan, thank you. What a job he does. Handsome devil, too. He's a handsome devil. Thank you, Dan. Guy Ressenschaller. Guy Ressenschaller. What? That's the toughest name in all of show business. Thank you, Guy. That's a great job. Lloyd Smucker. Lloyd, thank you very much. Thank you very much. 
Thank you, Lord. John Joyce, I saw him take the jacket off. That was quite a scene. Huh? That was quite a scene. Byron Donalds from Florida, who you met. The winner and a star. And a man who, right from the beginning, was with me. He's a tough guy, too. He used to sit outside. It was like 10 degrees below zero, and he wouldn't wear even an undershirt. And, and he's not that pretty to look at, I'll be honest. <laughs> but he's a tough cookie. And the people of the, of the state, of the Commonwealth, they really, they really love him. He's a, he's a fantastic American, fights like hell for everything that's good. Congressman Mike Kelly, right? How's that? Good job for you. Thanks, Mike. Good job, Mike. And today he's wearing a shirt. I don't want to see him without a shirt. <laughs> ambassador Carla Sands, who did a fantastic job a little while ago, and she was a great ambassador. Thank you, Carla. Beautiful job today. The mayor of Slippery Rock, John David Longo. John. Thank you. Thank you, John. Great job. And the man who's going to defeat your terrible Senator Bob Casey. Bob Casey, by the way, just so you, look, I don't want to spend. Nobody knows who the hell he is. His father was there a long time. He's there a long time. They're tough to beat. You know, when they, I was telling them, they, they are tough to beat. But this guy's a hero. He's a star. He was a brilliant student. Everything he ever did, he went to Wall Street. He became like one of the biggest people. And I know it's, it's, I just see it. Some of these guys, they've been there for years and years, and I'm not knocking them. They're survivors. What they are is survivors more than anything else. But this guy is an outstanding person. This guy is not a survivor. He's somebody that can really turn the country around and somebody that we need. And maybe I'd like to have him come up and say a few words. Dave McCormick, please. Come on up, Dave. Thank you, Mr. President. We are so proud to have you in the Keystone State. This is ground zero where you're going to go back to the White House based on what happens here in Pennsylvania. Right here, ground zero. And Mr. President, I'm so optimistic that you are going to win in Pennsylvania. You're going to win the presidency for two reasons. Number one, when I'm uh, going across our great commonwealth, the thing people say they want is common sense leadership, the kind of common sense leadership you showed when you were president. But the second thing, the second thing they say they want, and I tell them, I say, listen, uh, I was there with Mike Kelly and Dan Muser and Butler. I saw you get shot. I saw you come up. And I saw strength when you said, fight, fight, fight. Thank you, Mr. President. We're glad to have you with us here today. Uh, that's, he was there, by the way. He, he had just left the stage, actually. That was good timing. That was good timing. Just left the stage, right? I said, say hello to Dave. And then it began, a horrible thing. Also with us are Bob and Sherry Kepka. Where's Bob? I got to see Bob. Where is he? Where the hell is Bob? My golfing buddy. Bob Kep. So he's, a, he's the son of two great golfers, and they're both phenomenal people. One is Brooks. He's one of the best in the world. He just won last week. That is some, oh, look at him. He's shooting me as I'm talking. You, you can't, you can't do that. You're supposed to be standing up listening to every word. He's shooting it. I can't believe, okay, so, hey, Brooks, your father's doing a great job. Your family is the greatest. But Brooks is one of the greatest players in the world. He's got five majors already as a young man. Five majors, that's Hall of Fame all the way, right, Steve? And I'll tell you, he gets it from somewhere. He gets it from that guy, because that guy can play. We play each other, but Trump can play too. We play each other, we have a good time, right? We have to say hello to the family, you two boys, everybody, okay? Thank you, thank you both, Sherry, thank you. Great guy, great guy, great family. 
And two amazing Puerto Rican musical legends, they're legends, Justin Quiles and Onwell. Do you know who they are? Do you know who the hell they are? Come up here, just fast, fast, fellas, come on. Because I don't know if these people know who the hell you are. But it's good for the Puerto Rican vote. Every Puerto Rican is going to vote for Trump right now. We'll take Hi, fellas. Thank you, Mr. President, for having us here. For me, it's a real blessing to be here. I'm from Puerto Rico. We've, we are, yeah, we are a big part of the United States. We really depend on the United States. Since Trump hasn't been around, Puerto Rico's, yeah, it's not a secret. We've been going through a lot as a country. And yeah, Biden always promised, promised. A lot of politicians always promise through the years, but all of us know, the world knows, everybody's experienced it. The best president the world has seen, this country has ever seen. His name is President Trump. Thank you for having me here. To all my Puerto Ricans, let's stay united. Let's vote for Trump. I personally spoke with him. He wants to help Puerto Rico grow and succeed as a country. So let's stand all tall and united. And we all want to remember that. He, all, he wants to keep helping Latinos in the U.S. Let's, let's do things the right way, and let's keep growing. Let's keep growing as a family, and let's make America great again. God bless you. I'll also say a few words here. Mr. President, I'm beyond honored being here with you today. Mr. President, above all, I like you because I always say this, you're not a puppet. I love that about you. Yeah, I really do. I back you because I feel you're the most honest president we ever had. That's true. S saying things how they are, not what you think people want to hear. And that's very important. A lot of Latinos, we stand strong next to President Trump. A lot of Latinos, we love you as well. Thank you for sharing with us back there that how important building back Puerto Rico is. And not only building up Puerto Rico, but let's make America great again. Let's go. Wow, that's great. That's really nice. Great honor, fellas. Very talented guys, too. Uh, just one final, a friend of mine who's been a friend for a long time, one of the most successful people in New York and Florida and all around. Wherever he goes, he's successful. He never fails. He really does it. He's very extraordinary. Mr. Steve Whitkoff. He's right here. Steve, stand up. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. Thank you. Got one of the great families, too. One of the great, great families. Got a... One of his boys is looking down right now, very proud of dad, right? Looking down, your brothers, he's looking down, saying, I'm so proud of my dad. But Steve is just extraordinary. So thank you, Steve, for being here. Appreciate it. Thank you. From the moment we take back the White House from Kamala and Crooked Joe, we're going to have four of the greatest years in the history of our country. It's going to happen. We're going to get it done fast. Starting on day one, I will seal the border and stop the migrant invasion into our country. We will carry out the largest deportation operation in American history. We have no choice. We will halt the invasion and deport the illegals. She will let in the next 15 million people. And if they won in four years, we will have had over 100 million people from all over the world enter our country. And many of them, likewise, will be from prisons, mental institutions, gang members, criminals. We're not going to do it. She will destroy this country. She's worse than Biden. Because Biden wasn't a real believer in the radical left. She is. That's all she knew. That's what her father taught her, a Marxist professor. That's what he taught her. We will defeat inflation very quickly, and we will make America affordable again. People cannot afford to live here. We will make America the dominant energy producer in the world by far. I already brought it to number one. 
We were energy independent four years ago. Look what happened. We're energy. We're going to be energy dominant very soon. We have more liquid gold under our feet than any other country in the world, and we will use it to reduce taxes and energy costs for our people. We will also start paying down debt very substantially. In 12 months, we will cut your energy bills in half. We will cut them in half. And that includes heating, air conditioning, electricity, and gasoline. I will turn the United States into a manufacturing superpower very quickly. We're ready to do that. We had the most successful country economically in the history of the world, and we'll get it back very fast. We will no longer allow foreign countries to take our jobs and steal our wealth. In Mexico, they're building massive automobile factories that the UAW head doesn't know. The people know. That's why the people are for me within the UAW, United Auto Workers. But they're building massive plants. They're owned by China. They think they're going to make cars, sell them into the United States. No, they're not. I will put a 200 percent tariff on every single car, and no car will be coming to the United States. We will make our own products and buy far less from foreign countries that we are buying right now. Other countries that make us pay a tax to do business with them will be charged the same tax or tariff when they send their product into the United States. It'll be called the Trump Reciprocal Trade Act. So if China or any other country charges us a 100 percent or 200 percent tariff or tax, we will then charge them a 100 or 200 percent tariff or tax in return. I will end the electric vehicle mandate. I will cut every job-killing regulation of the Harris-Biden administration. I cut more regulations than any president in history by far. And I gave you the largest tax cuts of any president in history by far and make our auto manufacturing business stronger than ever before. We're going to bring in tremendous numbers of factories. They're going to all be brought in because it's going to be too expensive for people to make them outside. They're going to all come back. We're going to bring it back. We've lost 72 percent of our automobile manufacturing business over the last 30 years. It's going to come back. When I'm back in the White House, we will pass large tax cuts for workers and no tax on tips. No tax on So if you're a restaurant worker, a bartender, hospitality worker, a caddy, a barber, driver, or anyone else who relies on tip income, your tips will be yours. You know, they've given you inflation. They've taken all your money away. And, you know, she heard this, and two, three months later, she said, there will be no tax on tips. How original. That's why we, we talk about the American dream. She heard that the other day. So she'll start talking soon about she's going to bring back the American. She doesn't know what the American dream is. I will fight for and protect your Social Security and Medicare with no cuts whatsoever. And we will have no tax on Social Security benefits for our seniors. No more tax. Yesterday, I made a major new announcement if I'm elected this November. For the first time ever, your government will pay for or require insurance companies to pay for all costs associated with IVF fertility treatment. We want more babies to be born in America. We want more babies. We need them. We need them. We will cut wasteful and unnecessary spending, and we will terminate the Green New Deal and spend that money on roads, bridges, real infrastructure, and paying down debt, not fake infrastructure that has caused massive inflation with no benefit whatsoever to our country. I will settle the war in Ukraine, and I will end the chaos in the Middle East, and I will restore peace through strength very quickly. We will end the weaponization of government against the American people. We will protect religious liberty, and we will end the war on Christmas is back. Remember? Eight years ago, I said there's a war on Christmas. They were afraid to say Merry Christmas, and we had it won. But now, how much can it take? 
but we will stop that very quickly. Just don't buy. Anybody doesn't say Merry Christmas, you don't buy, and that'll be back very, very quickly. When I return to the White House, I will also stop the indoctrination of your children and protect your parents' rights. We're going to protect parents' rights. We will rebuild our cities, including Washington, D.C., making them safe, clean, and beautiful again. In Washington, D.C., you leave the Commonwealth, you want to go see the Washington Monument, and you end up getting stabbed. You look at dirty roads with bad barricades, with graffiti all over the marble. It's going to be cleaned up real fast. We're going to take it over. We're going to run it properly. And we're going to have tough law enforcement. People aren't going to be shot in Washington, D.C. anymore. And we will keep the U.S. dollar as the world's reserve currency. It's fading. We're not going to let that that would be like losing a world war. You can't let that happen. Then we would be a third world nation. This is how we will end the era of inflation, mayhem, and misery under Kamala and Crooked Joe. We will unleash safety, prosperity, and peace for Americans of every race, religion, color, and creed. Together, we will deliver low taxes, low regulations, low energy costs, low interest rates, low inflation so that everyone can afford groceries, a car, and a home. We will stop the invasion, end migrant crime, support our police, strengthen our military, build a missile defense shield all around our country. Other countries have it. Why shouldn't we? We're going to all make it right here in Pennsylvania and other places. We're going to make a lot of it right here in Pennsylvania, from what I hear. But Israel has it. It worked. 300 rockets shot. 299 got shot down. One got pretty seriously hit. But if you think about it, it's amazing technology. You know, Ronald Reagan wanted it many years ago, but the technology wasn't there. But now the technology is there. We're going to have it built. We're going to have that dome built right over us. We're going to have a beautiful, safe country. One way or the other, we're going to keep it safe. We're going to keep critical race theory and transgender insanity the hell out of our schools. And we're going to keep men out of women's sports. We will defend the Second Amendment, restore free speech, and we will secure our elections. Everyone will prosper. Every family will thrive. And every day will be filled with joy and opportunity and hope. But for that to happen, we must defeat Kamala Harris, a Marxist. And we must stop her country-destroying liberal agenda once and for all. We have to stop it. And I think a lot of things are happening. Look. People are seeing who she is. All you had to do is watch yesterday. Give me a break. That's not a president. That's not a president. That's not a president. And we can't let that person destroy our country. So get your friends, get your family, register, volunteer, and get the hell out to vote. Okay, front row Joe? Right? Because we want a landslide that is too big to rig. Too big to rig. Too big to rig. And go to swampthevoteusa.com. Swampthevoteusa.com. On November 5th, we will save our economy. We will rescue our middle class. We will reclaim our sovereignty and restore our borders. We will put America first, and we will take back our country. Together, we will make America powerful again. We will make America wealthy again. We will make America strong again. We will make America proud again. We will make America safe again. We will make America free again. And we will make America great again. Thank you very much, Pennsylvania. God bless you.